Did you know that once a part of Kale's questline actually had you looking around for a bird with a letter strapped to its leg? Have you seen a crow around here by any chance? You know, a burial crow with a letter fastened to its claw. I'd give you a generous sum for it, of course. And down here, we can find it, a so-called burial crow. And if you kill it in time, you can loot the Burial Crow's letter, which progresses Kale's questline, helping him to locate the underground area where his brothers were entombed long ago. This event in particular is a restoration of Kale's cut questline, and if you'd like to see the full thing, then Sekiro Doobie has a full restoration of it over on their channel. But it's not just the questline that might relate to the Burial Crows. You know those notes that you usually buy from merchants that give you hints about the world? Well, according to some version 1.0 text, it's also possible that hunting Burial Crows was originally the method by which you were supposed to loot these notes. And while we're talking about the merchants, did you know that at one point there was planned to be a travelling merchant who actually wandered around the map in Limgrave? According to Sekiro Dubi, again, evidence that the merchants actually travelled survives in the unused walk routes that are found in a couple of Elden Ring's old maps. For example, this is NPC 802, who could be found here on the western coast, before they set up here, by the Bridge of Sacrifice, south of the Evergale, then here in the Mistwood, and then finally at Storm Hill, near the Saints Bridge. To be clear, NPC 802 is an earlier type of merchant, one that actually had much deeper lore at the time. As the story goes, this merchant is actually aware of the dungeon underneath Lendell, where his brothers are entombed, and now he wanders around out of fear. Fear of staying in the same place and being locked up like his kin. It's great storytelling, and it's a shame it was cut because I think Elden Ring would have really benefited from more dynamic events like this. For number three, so one of the best strategies for taking out the Godskin duo is sleep. It takes one Godskin out of commission entirely, allowing the fight to become more of a one-on-one, -on -one, but you likely knew this already. What you might not have known is that the Godskin are actually supposed to be able to wake each other up, and this isn't even cut content. There's actually just a bug that prevents this interaction from taking place most of the time. As far as I can tell, this was first noted by Lil Aggie while they were doing a randomized race through Elden Ring. And then in a comment thread started by Zeostorm, everyone got to work uncovering the truth. And according to this Twitter user, the Godskin boss is actually able to perform this scream in the Windmill Village as long as you lure them down the hill where a celebrant is asleep. So why doesn't it work in the Godskin arena? Well, according to the fifth Matt on Twitter, the Godskin AI is supposed to do this waking animation if a friend is found to be asleep. But the ally detection is kind of bugged out in this arena because of the knights that patrol outside. So, when the fifth mat removed every single knight patrolling around the arena, as well as the hidden HP bar enemy, apparently it worked in their arena again. This might explain why the waking behavior works only in boss randomizers, because a lot of these end up with you fighting the godskin outside of their arena, so there aren't any patrolling enemies to bug out this intended effect when you play on a randomizer. As for a lore explanation, well, sleep and death are kind of similar in the real world in the sense that you're unconscious, and they do also seem to overlap as concepts in the Elden Ring world as well, as I discussed in my Mikola lore video. So it does make some sense that the Godskins being deeply aware of death might have also developed a way to wake each other out of it, though that is just speculation. But speaking of death, did you know that some of those who live in death can do this? I could try to explain this, but I think some things are just better without any explanation, you know? What also doesn't need any further explanation at this point is just how inspired From Software are by Kentaro Miura's Berserk. But just when you think you've seen every Berserk reference possible, another reading reveals another reference. I was reading chapter 82, and I looked at this panel, and it showed Griffith's last tear that was frozen, crystallized, making it look identical to the crystal tears that once fell from the Erd Tree. 
Another consistent thing in a lot of From's games is the presence of an enemy that should be hostile, but isn't. And in Elden Ring, that phenomenon shows up here, towards the end of Lanedale Capital, past a set of misbegotten. There's a friendly dog who won't attack you no matter what you do. Hopefully they never fix this in an update. Uh, but one thing they have finally fixed though is the raw medallion. It used to be that this only buffed a few raw effects, but now it properly buffs a broad spectrum of attacks, including the raw based dragon communion incantations, aspect of the crucible, breath, and even Placidusax's Ruin. Couple this with the Highland Axe, which also buffs raw attacks and can simply be put in your offhand, and you'll be a force to be reckoned with. There's good potential for a raw build here somewhere now, I think. For number eight, another thing that pops up in almost every From Software game is the presence of a character named Yulia. In Demon Souls, it was Yulia, the witch. In Dark Souls, it was the undead merchant who muttered the name Yulia, maybe talking about his sword, or perhaps the female undead merchant. We're still not really sure who he was calling Yulia, but anyway, then Yulia was actually a character in Dark Souls 3, and then she was a major character in De Racine, and then she was even a character in Elden Ring, before the name was changed. That's right, if you go through the cut dialogue, you'll find lines spoken from an earlier time in development, and back then, there was a man named Horalu, the Gold Mask, and Lady Yulia was the name of the deathbed companion who became Fia. And speaking of Fia, there's something extremely curious going on here at the northernmost minor Erd tree upon the Altus Plateau. Here, an omen can be found hunched over in a circle with a set of commoners around them. But what's really weird about these enemies is that these are all unique character models. The omen has a black cape and the commoners have a black set with a shroud over their face. But it's not just the models, they actually have unique casting animations as well. The commoners and the omen are capable of casting Fear's Mist complete with the little smoky symbol of death that Fear's Mist specifically does conjure up. I guess you could speculate that these enemies are sort of agents of Fear, considering that Fear's Mist is a unique death blight incantation that was developed specifically by her. But at the very least, even if that's not true, they're clearly aligned with Godwin's death blight and maybe even the new age that his ending portends to. It's also really curious that they're positioned right underneath what is a unique minor Erd tree. This one is almost entirely dead. Which reminds me then of the Shadow of the Erd tree teaser, which might be showing Godwin's death root clawing its way up around a dead or dying Erd tree. So I wonder if this little group is related to that. Hmm. Anyway. Speaking of the Shadow of the Erd Tree teaser, there's a few more things, believe it or not, in that image that I wish I pointed out in my speculation video. First is the wheat. I mentioned that wheat is a symbol of abundance and plenty, and I theorized that that might be related to Mikola since he's all about abundance as a character but this was then further validated by Quelag, who went into the Halig Tree's prayer room and actually found what looks like wheat sticking out of a pot here. Amazing find, honestly. A few of you guys in the comments also pointed out that a field of reeds is imagery that's associated with the Egyptian afterlife, which is considered to be the transition to the next stage of one's eternal journey. In my speculation video, I talked about how Mikola might be experiencing some sort of afterlife in this image, so I love how the Egyptian afterlife imagery really aligns with that. And lastly, I didn't mention the round graves because I didn't really have much to say about them, but a few of you guys also pointed out that these might represent the shape of Mikola's great rune. We don't know what his rune looks like, of course, but great runes typically are a circle with a line through them, so the idea that Mikola's might look like this is a very compelling theory as well. So shout out to everyone involved in bringing these theories to light. 
Turns out my 15 minute speculation video on one image wasn't long enough, apparently. And speaking of giant dead trees and things that I never mentioned, I also never got to point out this detail about Crucible Knight Siluria, who stands within a giant tree at the deep root depths. Sometimes, very rarely, we can learn something not just from weapons or their description, but from the name of their weapon arts. And the weapon art of Siluria's tree is Siluria's Woe, which suggests that she's despairing about something. It could be that she's just lost and dejected in the same way that so many Crucible Knights are, scattered around the lands between, you know, without a lord to lead them. Or maybe, considering that she can be specifically found and fought within a giant dead tree, maybe she's despairing about the age of the Crucible that has long since passed, and the bygone primordial Erd tree that her weapon is modelled after. It's food for thought. In the last Secrets video, I talked at length about bell bearings, and I also talked about the ball bells that their name was likely inspired by. We trade these bell bearings to the Twin Maiden Husks, and since then I've been made aware that this staff that they're holding is actually called a Kagura Suzu, which were often used in traditional Japanese dances, and they consist of 12 bell balls called Suzu, which supposedly allow one to acquire positive power and authority while repelling evil. Next comes via a tweet from Zyostorm, who actually does a lot of these secrets videos as well, if you're interested in watching some more. Here, he reminds us all of the Grand Spirit Tree Shield, which is a shield in Dark Souls 2 that depicts the blue spirit tree that, I quote, is said to possess divine powers, and it appears in the allegory of Keller, the god of dream. It goes on to say that once there was a boy who was easily frightened, until the talking tree of the dream world transformed itself into a shield to protect him. Obviously, the name Keller is just so similar to the name Mikola, and Mikola is considered a young boy as well. And as we discussed in our Mikola lore video, Mikola is heavily tied to dreams and a dream world via their alter ego, who is Saint Trina. And in the teaser, we see them with a giant tree, so there's a lot to unpack here. But I personally don't think there's much more here than just From Software continuing a naming convention that they started with Dark Souls 2. I feel like Mikola is just the spiritual successor of a theme that they started in Dark Souls 2. I don't think that Dark Souls 2 is actually related to Elden Ring canonically or anything like that. It's more that I think that From Software have these concepts and themes and naming conventions that they keep persisting in developing throughout all their games. But on that note, I feel like we should definitely keep an eye out in the future for all of the other gods that are listed on Dark Souls 2's name engraved ring, because Keller is one of them and who knows what other names might show up. But speaking of Dark Souls, I'd love to shout out the fact that Displate have just launched a new storefront filled with these officially licensed designs. And for a limited time only, you can get 20% off if you order one or two Displates, and 30% off if you order more than three, with a link in the description. The designs here are really good, but what really sets Displate apart are the metal plates and the printing process that they use. I'm still waiting for the official Dark Souls designs to get shipped out, so let me show off some of my own designs here so you can see what I mean. So even though they're printed on metal, this plate honestly match or even exceed the quality of many paper printed samples that I've tried over the years. The colors are rich, the blacks are deep, and they do this all while being more durable and more scratch resistant and waterproof as well. They're also easier to hang with sticky pads that won't damage your walls. So if you want to show off your love of Dark Souls in a unique and long lasting way, then please buy with the link in the description. Thanks to Displate for sponsoring this video and let's get back to it. So for number 14, throughout this whole video, I've referenced that Mikola lore video that I made and I referenced it a lot, but one thing that I did get wrong in that video was regarding the Albanorix. Back then, I said that the Albanorix never once entered the presence of the Halic Tree. I thought this because of the ivory sickle description, which states that 
these weapons are evidence of the Elbenoric's dedication to the Halig Tree, despite never having entered its presence. The Ivory Sickle says that, and I took this to mean that no Elbenoric had ever made it to the Halig Tree, but that's actually not true. It's probably just talking about the Elbenoric that wield this weapon. Because, as pointed out by a commenter named Van Jar and a few others in the comments, there are actually many Albanorix here. They're just all inside of cocoons. You can see their bodies here, if you look really closely. And Van Jar speculates that they seem to have died during a process of metamorphosis, mimicking Mikola himself when he sealed himself in a cocoon and into the Halic tree. So, I really like this theory. I like that there's a parallel between these characters. It would make sense that these creatures and many others in the Halig Tree might hope for a sort of rebirth, and it's pretty fascinating to learn that this rebirth might have been in the process of taking place, just by the environmental storytelling, which is amazing. So thank you for pointing out that environmental detail that I missed. Another thing that I wish I brought up in the video is that in version 1.0 of Elden Ring, Karia was, at one stage, actually documented as having a good relationship with Mikola. What I'm about to read is version 1.0's description of the Royal Guard set, which eventually became Loretta's Royal Knight set. It reads, Silver armor of the Arbor Sentinels, who serve the sacred tree of Mikola, the Scion Imperian. Hailing from Raya Lucaria, these enchanted knights once belonged to the Carian royal family, but were later gifted to Mikola, recipient of the vision by King Consort Radigan. The lapis blue trimmings reveal these origins. So Radigan gifted the sentinels to Mikola. Radigan was involved in this gifting, so I speculate that he and Renala were still married at this time, which would explain why he's making decisions on behalf of Caria here. Also, clearly the concept of Arbor Sentinels was scrapped and replaced with Loretta, who does serve a somewhat similar role, though she is said to have left Caria of her own free will. This description also calls Mikola the recipient of the vision, which I think is likely referencing a line of dialogue from Enya, who calls Marika the vision's vessel. So since Mikola is an Empyrean and worthy of becoming a god, like Marika was, it's likely that he was a recipient of the vision in the same sense as Marika. Interesting that the Greater Will has a vision for the Lands Between, but maybe that should be the topic of another video. Again, this is an item description that's available on version 1.0 of Elden Ring, and version 1.0 is technically playable by the majority of people, as it's just the version of the game that is on the physical console disc if you never update it. So unlike some other cut content, it is closer to the final version of the game, and thus perhaps also the developer's final vision for the game and the lore as well. But that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.